Hello, everyone. I welcome you all to yet another episode of podcast brought to you by IACCL. This is your host, Dr. Monalisa. I will be co-hosting this session with my colleague, Dr. Jacob Vergis. And today we're going to talk about how to navigate sedation practices in critically ill patients. So I'll start with you, sir. Today we are going to talk about sedation in ICU. And the first question is that uh, sedation in ICU has been a long evolution. We all know that how initially patients were on invasive mechanical ventilation and were initially sedated with propofol, which was gradually switched to benzodiazepines, then fentanyl, and then short-acting opioids, and now mostly dexmedetomidine. So what is the sedation protocol you follow in your ICU, and what factors do you need to consider in choosing an appropriate agent? So good evening, and thank you very much for inviting me to this podcast. So... Uh... In our ICU, so we first need to distinguish sedation from analgesia. So all our patients in the ICU will get sed analgesic. So usually that's an infusion of fentanyl. Occasionally it might be morphine, but so it'll be an so an analgesic infusion will be given initially at least for the first uh, for someone who's undergoing prolonged ventilation. Uh, sedation is usually not given upfront. Uh, sedation may be given if required if the patient is very uncomfortable or very anxious or is struggling to vent synchronize with ventilation. Some patients may get uh, propofol infusion uh, for sedation. Some patients will get dexmedomidine, especially when we are say, trying to get off the uh, sedation and you know patient still needs a little bit of calming, then we will often switch off everything else and keep the patient on dexmedomidine infusion. Uh, so that's the essential protocol that, as far as the drugs are concerned. But I think a very important uh, factor is also monitoring of sedation. And the aim would be to keep the patient as light as possible. Having said that, some patients do need deep sedation and analgesia in the initial phases of if they are very sick. But we try and keep the sedation as light as possible. So we monitor the sedation score. Usually it's the, the RAS score. The RAS score is what we sort of monitor. We rarely use BISCs, but and some of people might use the Ramsey score. But some score is always used to monitor the sedation. And we also test for delirium in every shift if the patient is being uh, with, a, with a CAM IC that's sort of uh, tested in the most patients. So that's in a nutshell what we tend to do in our IC. So analgesia for all sedation for some at certain times, or uh, the go-to drug if required might be a propofol infusion. Uh, after about 12 to 24 hours, we would like to switch to boluses rather than maintain prolonged infusions. If we have to maintain prolonged infusions for some reason, then intermittent cessation uh, will be practiced where we allow the patient to wake up, assess everything, and maybe resedate at maybe a slightly lower dose, depending on the needs of the patient. Thank you, sir. Uh, when the debate regarding which agent is good is still in and out and going on, there are more and more evidences coming out advocating the use of Inhalation sedatives for routine sedation in mechanically ventilated patient. So where do you place inhalation sedation in your ICU at, the, at this stage? And if anything, what are the advantages? So inhaled sedation, like you mentioned, is an emerging sort of uh, trend or strategy for sedation in uh, ICUs. It's quite popular in European ICUs. We have been using this in our ICU. Although the default still remains intravenous, but we are tending to use a bit of uh, inhaled sedation. In fact, uh, uh, we've done a trial in our ICU, the instinct trial, which was uh, you know, a sort of a feasibility study, which we published in IJCM some time back. And I think Dr. Kulkarni is leading a, a randomized yes. trial across India for inhaled sedation. So it's going to catch on. So essentially, you know, uh, we use either sevoflurane or uh, Isoflurane, these are inhaled anesthetics, which anesthesiologists are actually quite familiar with in the operation theater, not so much those who do not work in the operation theater. But recent, uh, uh, so what is uh, the advantages of this is the very rapid acting and very, so the onset and offset of sedation is quite rapid. Titratability is very good. Uh, it is theorized that uh, some of them may have a lung protective effect, they reduce lung inflammation. So maybe there might be a benefit in, say, ARDS or some lung, uh, acute lung injury or ventilator-induced lung injury for that matter. There may be some uh, benefits in uh, uh, as far as uh, cerebral blood flow is concerned, as far as ischemic preconditioning is concerned. But these are all uh, 
theoretical. They have not been well tested in randomized controlled trials. Hypothetically, they seem to be advantages. Uh, they can, they are both uh, isoflurane, especially a mild bronchodilator effect. So that's uh, pretty useful. So there may be some advantages, but I think the main thing would be very rapid titration of the sedation. These are not metabolized. You see, they just come in the lungs and they get blown away. So there's hardly any systemic absorption, hardly any systemic effects, though theoretically some, some absorption could take place. But, you know, you can easily monitor the effects of these uh, agents very well. And uh, there are potential dangers of contamination of the environment of the uh, air with the, with the exhaled uh, uh, agents. But there are many ways to take care of active or passive scavenging. So all those sort of methods are there. So yes, there is a promise for inhaled sedation. And uh, I guess as people become more familiar with it, its use will, maybe it will pick up more and more. And as we have more trial and more evidence, we'll probably be using it much more. But it's definitely doable and it's very sound, sound medically, very sound scientifically. And we've got good equipment to do inhaled sedation. Thank you, sir. That was a beautifully summarized advantages uh, of using inhalational sedation in our ICU. My next question is also on the same topic. Uh, we are using anaconda device these days more and more, and it is becoming very popular in an ICU. Could you please explain how does it actually work? How does the anaconda device actually work? Okay, so that's a nice technical question. Uh, so anaconda actually stands for anesthesia conserving device okay and uh, it's now taken over by a company called sedana and they now call it sedaconda i think okay? so that's but it's essentially so essentially what it is 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 it's like a heat and moisture exchanger that we have like a filter that we have it has in addition it's got a sort of what we call as evaporating rods so if you can imagine a filter the same hmef that we use it has it works like a bacterial filter and a heat and moisture exchanger as well, bacterial oil filter. Then it's got an evaporating rod, right? And it's got one inlet uh, through which the liquid agent, inhaled agent, that is usually sevoflurane or isoflurane, is injected at a very at a fixed uh, rate, which you can vary. That evaporating rod vaporizes, allows the liquid to evaporate. Okay. And then that vaporized like, uh, inhaled agent goes to the patient and produces sedation. Right? And the depth of sedation can be adjusted depending on the needs of the patient. And you can adjust your flow rate from the syringe into the uh, device, depending on the distance. Now, the innovation in this is that in addition to your heat and moisture exchanger, the, the mesh that you have, there is a carbon fiber mesh, okay, which is there. And that absorbs the inhaled, the agent, the sevoflurane or isoflurane, which is coming back from the patient in the exhaled air. And it traps that. And 90% of the inhaled agent is trapped in that uh, uh, carbon mesh, the carbon uh, 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 carbon net or whatever you want to call it. And just like the heat and moisture exchange, like moisture gets uh, vaporized again. In the next breath, that, vaporize, that uh, uh, inhaled agent gets vaporized into the patient. So you actually don't need a lot of liquid agent to be injected because a lot of it is, is stored in the exhaled breath. And that goes back to the patient. So conserve the anesthetic, which is otherwise could be expensive. You conserve the anesthetic and you maintain moisture and you maintain uh, uh, the bacterial and viral filter property. So that's essentially what it does. The exhale, now from the inhaled port, you can monitor what we call as the anesthetic concentration, which is going into the patient, what we call as the end tidal anesthetic concentration. So you can, that's like you... In uh, IV anesthesia or IV sedation, you cannot monitor or deter see what is the blood level of your drug that you're giving. But here you can actually see the concentration of uh, the agent in your alveoli, right? So it tells you how deep uh, it is in the alveoli as well. Plus you're monitoring the clinical effect, right? They do produce a little bit of hypotension, especially isoflurane, which causes vasodilation. So you need to just initially be careful about the blood pressure, which you can titrate. And then... From the exhaled port, in order to minimize contamination of the environment of the of the bedside ICU environment, you can there is a device called uh, it's called a flusob, which which absorbs. It's like a canister into which the exhaled gas goes and it absorbs the inhaled uh, anesthetic, and so it doesn't uh, spill over into the OT air. So that is in a nutshell of how the anaconda now what we call it, the sedaconda works, and you know and 
So when you start off the sedation, you need to give a slightly higher sort of bolus dose, you know, one to five ml of you know, per hour of the agent. And then you can afterwards, you can maintain it much lower dose, half to two or half to three ml per hour of the uh, anesthetic agent. That again, I hope in a nutshell, I roughly tells, gives you a good idea of how the device uh, works. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I Thanks, think uh, sir. the technique was well explained uh, uh, in a nutshell uh, for the crowd to know that the, the, the concept is very clear. So now we move to the last question, uh, which is a little bit of uh, interest uh, gaining uh, recently. You know, sedation in ICU is always a thorny issue with regards to uh, it increases sometimes the duration of mechanical ventilation, length of stay, and especially delirium. Delirium in the ICU, we all link to the agents what we have used. And now, patients who are cooperative, who are not agitated, who are not irritated, nowadays, that's no sedation policy is something which, uh, you know, it's coming up nowadays. So we would like to know your views on the same, sir. Yeah. Again, great question. Uh, so again, uh, just want to emphasize that when you say no sedation, it doesn't mean you're not giving an analgesic. So we are always giving an analgesic in the background. Okay? And maybe if that a little fentanyl or morphine cause a little drowsiness that's part of the analgesic uh, sort of component which is going in. Whether to add a, a sedative, you know, that's propofol, midazolam, or so one of those sort of drugs. So, we are definitely moving away from deep sedation with intermittent sedation to titrated light sedation. So, as deep or as light as the patient requires. Now, the, the, one of the very early studies, you know, in 2010 was done by Danish group, uh, I think Strom or someone was the first author, they compared no sedation versus sedation with, uh, and of course, all patients got morphine in the background. And they found that there was no difference in any outcomes uh, and that sort of thing, but there was a slightly higher incidence of agitated delirium in patients who had no sedation. However, there have been other studies now, and there's been a very, very recent meta-analysis, which looked at light sedation versus deep sedation or no sedation versus light sedation. And they found that overall there is no difference in any outcomes, including delirium. Okay. So it seems that if you can are able to give the patient the lightest sedation that they deserve, it does not harm the patient. And in fact, uh, it, it may actually accelerate recovery and uh, you know weaning from ventilation, which is at the end of the day, that's what we try to do for our patients, get them out of the ICU as fast as possible. So there is clearly a case uh, that the way sedation has evolved, like you mentioned at the beginning, start, that of course there are patients who need deep sedation at some stage initially, but you must try and get rid of the sedation as fast as possible and you know get the patient up and about and moving. And apart from just uh, sedation, well, there is also stress on delirium prevention or monitoring and prevention and mobilization, and early mobilization and physical activity. So I think all these sort of things have to come together when you are looking at a ventilated patient. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, I think uh, all the four questions has been answered uh, with clarity, precision, and uh, the, the viewers will definitely get an idea about uh, sedation policies in the ICU. So thank you once again for joining us and giving your insights and inputs uh, on this very important topic. Thank you, and thank you for this very nice and innovation that you are doing. And thank you for inviting thank me. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Tune in for the next episode of podcast brought to you by ISCCM next month. Uh, thank you, everyone.